From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. Portland's daytime camping ban has been in effect for a week now. The city council passed the ordinance last month. It bans camping on public property from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m. and includes stricter rules on camping during all other hours. It also includes penalties for those who violate the rules. Twice, they'll get a written warning. But if they violate the camping policy three times, police can fine them up to $100 or they might even be sentenced to 30 days in jail. The mayor has said those penalties will be phased in and it may be months from now that we're in a period of education right now. And Commissioner Rene Gonzalez has said almost no one will be going to to jail. Some people, including business owners, say the camping ban is long overdue. The camping in front of their businesses has scared customers away, while others say the daytime camping ban criminalizes homelessness. In this episode of Straight Talk, we look at the impact the camping ban is having on the homeless community, service providers, and shelters with a panel of nonprofit leaders who work closely with people who are homeless. Kaya San is the executive director of Street Roots, a homeless advocacy group which also publishes a weekly newspaper assisting people experiencing homelessness by creating income opportunities. Liz Starkey is development director for Rosehaven. Rosehaven is the only day shelter in Portland serving women, children, and marginalized genders. Also joining us, Scott Kermit, the executive director of Blanchet House. Blanchet House is a Portland nonprofit offering free meals, transitional shelter, and pathways to recovery, lending a helping hand to anyone who needs it. Welcome everyone to Straight Talk. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you, Laurel. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah. Well, in this episode of Straight Talk, since this camping ban has taken effect, we want to get the perspective from you, from your organizations, your shelters, from the people that you're working with and the impact it's having. But first, let's find out a little bit more about what you all do. We'll start with Liz Starkey and Rose Haven. Yeah, so Rose Haven is the only day shelter and community center in Portland specifically for people marginalized by their gender. So we offer a safe place to go during the day where you can access resources, but most importantly, we're upholding dignity for folks that have been systematically marginalized. And Scott Kerman from Blanchet House. Yeah, for 71 years, Blanchet House has been alleviating suffering, uh, mostly by providing free meals three times a day, six days a week. We also have two transitional housing programs, one in Old Town and one in Yamhill County, our Blanchet Farm for men who are seeking an opportunity for recovery and stability in their lives. And Kaya San from Street Roots. Yeah, so Street Roots, many of you know Street Roots is the newspaper all over town that you can buy. So part of what we do is really try to connect people across housing status. We're creating jobs for people experiencing homelessness. And like Lanche House and Rosehaven, we are bustling all the time because we're providing a lot of other services because there's such a need. And vendors sell the papers. Right? They sell the papers, so this is their job. Yeah. Well, we talked when the ban went into effect on Friday, July 7th, we talked to a number of people on the street to find out their, how they were feeling about right. it. So let's listen to a couple of clips from that story. My life is just falling apart slowly, but I'm trying to put it back together. It's really hard. We don't have money. That's why, like, that's why we're out here in tents already. So like, us paying a fine is unrealistic. I'm trying, and every time I get a step ahead, they kick me two steps back, but it's not their fault. You know, they're just following procedure. You know what I'm saying? They're following the mayor. You know? and, so, yeah. and Kaya, as you mentioned, yeah. your cover story for this week is about the ban, a ban without right. a plan. So tell us about how this is impacting the people that you work with, this camping ban. Yeah, and this story was written by our Snowden intern, Jeremiah Hayden. Um, it is impacting folks in a number of ways. One of them is just because there's such a disconnect between this plan and the reality that people, in a sense, are stuck in a limbo of terror. So what I'm seeing is a lot of mental health struggles around um, this fear that anything could happen at any moment. Everyone's a little bit confused. And I'm seeing more people actually just on the sidewalk without tents. So it just feels a little bit more raw. Well, Liz Starkey, let's talk about what's happening at Rose Haven and the reality of this camping ban. Help people understand what it means for the people you work with. Do they have to pack up everything in the morning, at, like their tents, all their belongings, and where do they go and how is it affecting Rose Haven? That is essentially the expectation is that people are going to pack up all of their belongings every single day and carry them with them. And this impacts the folks that we serve, women, children, and trans and non-binary folks the most, I would argue. 
because those folks tend to stay up all night to stay safe and watch their back and sleep during the day. Um, so this has taken away that little bit of safety that they had um, and it's really impacting our guests. And, and I'd follow that by saying that we're already at capacity. Mm -hmm. We're serving about 150 people a day, so to expect them to bring their belongings inside as well impacts the number of folks that we can safely serve. And do you have storage area for people to bring all their things? Uh, we have a small room for storage, but we're actually in the process of renovating that so we can offer more mental health services and advocacy services because we are, as Kaya said, seeing an escalation in the mental and physical health needs of our guests. And so we actually just launched a mental health program offering one-on-one -on -one counseling as well as group sessions. Um, and we need the, desperately need the space for those private conversations because folks cannot put the pieces back together if they don't have a safe and private place to, to have those tough conversations. And now you're having to work on these immediate needs. Is that affecting what you're able to do long term for people? It certainly does. Um, in the amount of time that it would take one of our advocates to de-escalate one person in extreme crisis, they probably could have filled out three housing applications. Mm. We'll jump in here, Scott, because tell us a little bit more about how this is impacting Blanche House and the services that you offer there. Well, I think it's important to, to recognize that a lot of the people that we serve and a lot of the people who are unsheltered and homeless right now are elderly and they're disabled. We have uh, many individuals who suffer from trauma, traumatic brain injury. Some of our older clients were starting to worry about the onset of dementia and cognitive impairment that can come with age. So this is a lot for them to take in. Um, the camping ban is very complicated. I think there's probably even the four of us may have a hard time understanding all of the details of it. It's beyond the reach of the people that we're serving. And so it's not so much a, a camping ban um, as it is kind of forced mobility. They, mm. they just have to figure out where, you, where are they going to go and how are they going to care for their things if they have pets with them. Um, it's like a long march. And one of the places that they're going to march to is Blanche House. And so we're working as a staff to, to find ways that we can help them and make sure that they understand that despite what's happening in our community with regards to this ban, that we still have a lot of compassion and heart for them. And they depend on you a lot for communication with what's going on. Are you getting the information you need? Well, not really. I mean, because I, I don't know if there's a lot of information yet to share. Um, the mayor's office has said that they're still working this out, <laughs> a, a ban without a plan. Um, if that plan is forthcoming, um, we'll just have to wait and see what it looks like. Um, and so it really impacts the trust that we try to create with the people we serve because they expect us to have answers and we don't have any answers for them right now. And what about storage for you at, at Blanche mm -hmm. House with all these belongings? Yeah, I mean, storage is tricky. We let people bring in as much stuff as, as they can reasonably bring in during the meals. It helps them settle into the meal because they're not worried about their things being stolen. But there's still a limit, even in a space as large um, that we use for our free cafe. Uh, and so we've been giving out um, rolling suitcases as a way for people to consolidate their belongings and make it easier for them to bring it into our space. In fact, we just had a big giveaway yesterday. We gave away 90 rolling suitcases. And the public had donated these suitcases? Yeah, these were all donated. And then if you, if you came to our breakfast or lunch today, you would have seen people at the tables with their roller bags next to them, much like if you were at the airport right now. Do you need more suitcases that people wanted to donate anymore? Uh, we are still collecting more suitcases. We're looking for roller bags in good condition, um, zippers that work. Um, they don't look too beat up. Um, whenever we give things to people, we want to make sure that they're things that we would accept ourselves mm -hmm. because that means it's dignified. What about the penalties that we're hearing about? What impact is that having on the people that you talk with, Kaya? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really stark because we look at, you know, we're, we're at about 30 percent. We have about 30 percent of the shelters that we would need. So we clearly have this big chasm between what we have for people to go to and what we need. And I should say that, you know, there a city that does provide enough shelters for everyone, like New York City, it's still not providing the answer, right? There's 100,000 people stranded in shelters um, and they spend two billions of dollars a year trying to maintain those. So just to kind of make sure sure that that's clear. But this penalty is about jail, which not only then entangles people further in the legal system, but it's also really expensive. It's, you know, $400 a night. So when they talk about 30 days in jail, that's $12,000 per person per penalty. 
I think that again, talking about that disconnect, we can sure do better things with that money. And I, I you know, know that people are, are extremely afraid of just having more fines, more penalties that really just put them in this, in you know, this kind of um, purgatory. Well, the mayor and the council have said, and we should say that Commissioner Carmen Rubio is the only commissioner who voted against this ban, that the ban's intended to get people into temporary or affordable housing, and the long-term goal is to have enough shelter and housing space to totally eliminate unsanctioned camping. So, Scott, that's a good goal, isn't it? Is this a step in the right direction? Well, I, I, it, it's putting the enforcement before the objective can be realized, right? If everybody acknowledges that we're a long way away from having enough shelter, and we have to acknowledge too, not all beds are created equal. Um, not everybody is suitable for every single bed. We have a, a diverse population in our community. They have a diverse array of needs, um, to, and not all shelters can meet those needs. And so um, I think this was Commissioner Rubio's point, that it seems like we should have places for people to go in place before we move forward with a camping ban. I think you've all heard this before. Liz and I were talking about this earlier on the, on the phone, that there are a lot of people who say that all of you are part of the homeless industrial complex. That, that you're part of the problem and that you're all making money off this problem and, and, and increasing the problem. Liz, how would you react to that train of thought? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the public really believes that the money is being spent on our citizens and, and the fact of the matter is that none of our organizations receive public funding for our programs. Day services have never been a part of the conversation and homelessness lasts 24 hours a day. So that's where we're at. Scott, you want to weigh in? Yeah, I mean, I, I find it to be fairly cynical and, and even dystopian sometimes. We've had people call us on the phone when we've talked about how we're saving lives with Narcan, that we should just let people die. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just not something I think any of us are going to subscribe to. Uh, we feed hungry people, and us you know, stopping what we're doing is not going to suddenly house them. They're not just going to go away. Um, we have a commitment in this community, I think it's a moral and ethical one, um, to help people who are struggling. And that's what we do. We help people who have nowhere else to go and, and no one to turn to. And if, if that's a crime, then um, Fine, I'll do the time. Well, the city and county have instituted this ban that the Portland City Council has, and you're getting no money. You're getting more pressure from this ban on your shelters, but you get no city or county money, no money from the metro tax? I, I should clarify that we do get funding for our Rose City Resource Guide. We distribute 200,000 of them. Our, our Your listeners can come by street routes and pick one up with all the services, and we get funding for some specific things like our ambassador program, so I wanna make sure. But I'm not for your services. That. That you not for our regular daily services. So you're getting more pressure from this ban, but no money from the city or county or joint office of homeless services? Yeah, that's no, correct. Nothing. So are and you asking for money? We, we are asking for there to be less barriers to this public funding because what I think what a lot of people don't realize is that it's oftentimes a reimbursement process. So the nonprofit is actually expected to front the money to do the work first and then go back to the county with receipts and fight for the money. And you literally do have to fight for the money. I've heard horror stories from other organizations of paychecks bouncing and they've had to pay out of their personal accounts to prevent that. And so that's just one of the reasons why there's so many things that need to change in the actual distribution of the funds. And I think that that's where a lot of the problem is lying. So you're hoping that this will shed light on the resources that you all need. Exactly. Yeah, I, and I think it's gonna shed light on the valuable role that day services like, like we all provide. Um, places for people to go during the day, whether it's for food, showers, and sometimes just a place to find community and, and set your belongings down and feel safe and feel like you're, you're someplace where you're, you're welcome. Um, community and connection is not only essential for one's mental health, but also our physical health as well. It's one of the five social determinants of health. And so the fact that we and others provide um, spaces for that are really valuable to our community and we can often be a gateway into housing so if the if the objective is to get people into housing then it seems reasonable that um, programs like ours would receive more support and I, I just want to jump in with that too to just add that um, for the organizations that are receiving government contracts they're reimbursed at a lower level than if the same people were doing public sector jobs so that is a real fight among a lot of nonprofits is actually 
actually to try to get the labor costs covered. Um, and and when, when all of you hear terms like enabler and grifter, just realize I always am aware that those are stop talking points that are coming from very organized efforts to undermine the social safety net. So it's part of something larger, and it's not this kind of innocuous thing to be to be um, passing on. It's it's really to undermine the larger effort of, of a society that's taking care of all its people. Well, let's get the perspective of, of the business owners and the businesses mm -hmm. who are saying that that camping around their businesses is scaring people away from their businesses and scaring people away from coming downtown. When the city council passed the ordinance, we talked to a business owner who didn't want to go on camera, but his name is Bob, mm -hmm. and he says his business is going down, gone down 20%. So let's listen to what he had to say. That, that just means there's no teeth. Absolutely. I mean, they, they don't have $100 to pay, so they just won't pay it. So what, what's there going to be, a bench warrant? It doesn't make any sense. There's, there's, it's, it's, it'll be ineffective, completely ineffective. It's, I don't know why it's taken so long for the city to start addressing this problem. It's just been getting worse and worse. We actually have a maintenance person that hangs out around here, and he has two five-gallon buckets full of used needles just that he's picked up in the last two years. I feel like I have no voice. I don't think no regular citizens have a voice at all. In addition, Kaya, a DHM mm -hmm. poll showed an overwhelming number of Portlanders. 78% of the respondents said that they favored mm -hmm. this camping ban. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to them? What, what's the solution from your point of view? Absolutely. Well, I think a lot of people are really sensitive to the kind of humanitarian crisis we're all seeing and that they're desiring a solution. And this can seem on the surface like a solution. Um, I would say that we could probably, if we talk to the, most of the police, they would probably you know, let us all know that they are not able to actually um, cover this labor. I mean, we have essentially a city council that's setting up impossible situations and undermining efforts to um, actually to reduce the police per, uh, workload. From Portland Street Response since February, Commissioner Gonzalez has, has stopped hiring with Portland Street Response, so it's a program that's getting starved out. One of its objectives is actually to reduce police labor, and it does, just even at a small smaller capacity. Last year it reduced p police labor by 3.5 percent when it was operating. If it could fully be funded and supported and not starved out in this way, you know, it would really help actually the police. The same thing with this camping ban. It's just making work harder and so the police can't actually do the work that they really need to be doing. And Liz, you were telling me that you sat down, all of you, with the governor and first lady who's a social worker to talk about this problem. Did you come away feeling confident that, that the state was going to help come to some solutions here? I'm hopeful. Um, Governor Kotek seems to understand the issues. What we were really advocating to her for was we need a place for our most sick and injured citizens because there are some folks that are just not set up to be in a congregate setting with 150 other people in the room. Um, and I think that a lot of people don't realize there's just simply no place for those folks to go. The hospitals don't have capacity and it bogs us down quite a lot. So that's one thing that we're really hoping for. But I think the biggest takeaway for me out of that conversation was understanding how difficult Mul Multnomah County really is as far as all of the bureaucracy. Want to weigh in at all, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> you know, someone, uh, another, another uh, nonprofit leader expressed the other day, and he, he described it as a, as a giant sandbox uh, with, with the county and the city uh, on either side not really getting along with each other. And, but it, when, they, when they kick sand at each other, it's often the nonprofits and the people we serve who end up with sand in our face. Well, it's time for us to take a break. On that note, when we come <laughs> back, we're going to continue our conversation on the daytime camping ban and look at some of the ways you might be able to help. We're back in two minutes. Welcome back to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. We're talking about Portland's daytime camping ban that started last Friday and the impact it's having on people who are homeless and on service providers. Our guests work with people every day who are directly affected. Welcome once again to Liz Starkey from Rosehaven, Kaya Sand from Street Roots, and Scott Kerman from Blanche House. Once again, it's really nice to have you here. Thank you for joining us. And we, during the break, Scott, we were talking about how you 
are worried. People are going to be disappointed. The people who support the camping ban and that poll are going to be disappointed. What did you mean? Uh, what I meant is I think we all understand that the status quo is not sustainable. It's not healthy for, for anyone, including the people that we serve. Um, the camping ban is not going to be the solution. And if people are investing themselves emotionally in this camping ban, thinking this is what's going to solve everything that is, is happening in our community, uh, they're going to be disappointed. And I'm afraid what that disappointment might lead to. There are solutions. We have solutions in place. And these are the things that we think um, the city and the county should be focused what on. What are some of the solutions, Kaya? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things we need to do is have um, a kind of patience, but also bring down a lot of the barriers and make the systems work better in terms of getting rent assistance to people, you know, uh, duplicating Project Turnkey and all the other things about vacancies turning them into residencies, um, substance use disorder treatment, that we make sure that we're having enough recovery beds, mental health support that, you know, since deinstitutionalization in the 90s, right, we've lacked that. So the Behavioral Health Resource Center, other efforts like that, we need to get over the rocky spots as a community and realize there's always going to be rocky spots and, and persevere. Um, and then I just want to say with all of us, I mean, we, we're all support, all the nonprofits are really supporting each other. Sometimes there's a myth that it's the opposite, but we're so grateful for each other and we're always partnering and trying to lift each other up. So for instance, for Street Roots, we're running a capital campaign because we have to increase our services. We're gonna you know, build uh, 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 showers and laundry. And we have a picture of training. the rendering of what you're building on 3rd yeah. and Burnside. Yeah, and so we're doing all that because the need is so much bigger. But meanwhile, we always learn from Rose Haven who recently did an extraordinary expansion we always learn from Bland Shea House. We, Sisters of the Road is now expanding, Afro Village PDX, Ground Score, all these organizations. And we're learning, we're, we send people to each other, um, we communicate, and we make sure that we provide people with a whole lot of love because honestly, that's um, really lacking. And Liz, your organization was giving out these sleeping shelters. And when the ban took effect, we talked to you and you showed our reporter how they work. Let's take a look at the demonstration that you showed us. They're like a sleeping bag and a tent all in one. And then if you have to get up and move, it's really easy to fold it up, roll it up, and take it with you. So how can people help you? Do you need more donations for those sleeping shelters, that kind of thing? We all desperately need donations. Um, you know, we're stepping up to fill the gap and do the work, and we are completely reliant on the kindness and the generosity of our community. We are funded by individual uh, contributions, in-kind donations, everything from the granola bars that we pass out and the tents and the sleeping bags, you know, to, to the wages that we pay our staff. That all comes from the community. And so we need each and every one of you watching today to be a part of the solution if you want to see the change. And Scott, what could you use at Blanche House? Do you need volunteers? Yeah, we can always use volunteers. It's such a great experience to volunteer at Blanche mm -hmm. House because it is direct service. You are feeding people and that's such an intimate and compassionate act. And it takes about 35 to 40 volunteers a day for us to, to serve our meal program. And you were talking about the, the wheeled suitcases that you gave out, um, that you could use more of those. Um, what else could you use? Well, we're always, uh, sometimes we're both posting for clothing. Um, we hand out a lot of clothing to people. Um, and like Liz said, I mean, we survive because of the generosity of people who write us checks, large well, and small. Let's put your websites up so people um, are empowered to help you out. There, streetroots.org. Uh, rosehaven.org and blanchethouse.org. You can go there to get more information. Let me ask Liz for a, a final call to action. How do you want to leave this today with, with viewers? I just hope that after everybody has learned about this, that they'll recognize that we are working towards solutions, but that we all have to be a part of working together to make this change, and that we do all want the same thing. None of us want to see our houseless members you know, out on the street during the day when people are trying to do business, but we have to have a safe place where they can go during the day to receive phone calls and put the places, you know, the pieces back together. So I'm, I'm hopeful that this is going to start that conversation and people are going to be asking where are people going during the day and we're going to have more of those services that can actually help people move the needle and go to that next step of their recovery. How about 15 seconds, Scott, for a final thought? Um, I want people to, to maintain the heart that has really, I think, 
inspired us throughout this whole crisis. It's, it's three plus years on now since the pandemic really threw everything for, for a curve. Um, and I know there's a lot of frustration, but people still have a lot of love for, for the community and the community that's suffering. Well, I want to thank all of you for what you do. Thank you for being on the show, Liz Starkey, Scott Kerman, Kaya Sand. We have a lot more to talk about. We really want to dig into Portland street response a little bit more and the drug problem on the streets. We're going to do that in a special bonus episode of Straight Talk. You can find on KGW's YouTube channel and on KGW+. Plus. We thank you so much for watching. Join us next week. We'll look at a transformational project for downtown Portland, the Broadway Corridor. It's going to go in where the old post office used to be. What's that all about? Join us next week for Stray Talk.